And now, it's time for Mob Talk Radio with your host, Jeff Canarsi. And welcome back to Mob Talk Radio. At this point, we're going to talk about the Catronis, but I'm going to offer up a bit of a warning, okay? Because I'm just being straight up. My show's copyrighted, okay? So if anybody decides they want to play little rat games, uh, you will be met with consequences. Because I just don't like that kind of shit. Uh, Anything that I say on this show, I'll say to someone. So it's not like I'm doing it hidden on a platform and any of this kind of nonsense. So if you're one of those people that likes to play that game... Uh, believe me, I'll find out who you are. And you won't like what I do. Uh, so it's just a warning. I'm just being straight up about it. I'm sick of a lot of shit. Uh, and that's all there is to it. So if you will just excuse my behavior today, I just fed up, just fed up with a lot of different stuff. So all of that being said, the Catroni crime family, uh, before we even go down this path, uh, there's a few things that I want to say. First of all, number one, this isn't going to be a huge part and and you'll understand by the time we get to the the end of the first episode of the Catronis why that's the case so while we dove head first into the Papalia crime family uh there was you know so much information to digest uh you know I almost kind of feel like in some ways that I gave you too much information but I always try to give you the best sort of narrative when discussing historical uh figures so that you have sort of a, a totality of information to absorb uh, with the Catronis, you know, it's a bit different uh, as there is a ton of information, but it's not as in-depth per se as I want it to be. Uh, and there are a lot of things to focus on. Uh, most mob families, they, you know, they all begin the same way. They immigrate to the United States, they get their feet wet, and most follow an upward trajectory into organized crime. Uh, the story of the, uh, excuse me, the Catronis is no different as politics is going to play a huge part in their narrative and then their storyline. Canada, by nature, uh, just seems to be really the one place that couldn't facilitate or avail of themselves a lot without the New York mob's permission or their involvement as the Canadian mafia answered to the American mafia in New York. They all answered to them. The other side of that is the Bonanno crime family, who seemed to back everybody but the Papalia crime family. It's an odd thing, and I hope at least uh, I explained it well enough, uh, you know, last week or weeks prior about the beef between Joe Bonanno and Stefano Magadino, at least to show you the ego and greed involved in all of that and and where sort of the American mafia wanted to take things. The Bonanos were not exactly loyal to really anybody. It just kind of came down to dollars and cents uh, more than anything. So while we may not have an entire complete profile on uh, Vincenzo Catroni, What we have more so in this chapter of our Canadian series is events unfolding which allow the Catronis to become very powerful but eventually wane because of a lack of support from American mafia families. It's a tale of be careful putting your eggs into one basket, which really is sort of the whole mob culture, to be honest with you. Uh, The Catroni crime family is what we call an Andrina. Uh, They're not the mafia. They are uh, Calabrian and considered Andrangheta. Uh, There are wide gaps between the mentality of Cosa Nostra and Andrangheta, and we have talked at length on the show about what those differences are. And not really to rehash that, but the the rules are different, and almost everyone in Andrangheta is related by blood, which is what Sicilian Cosa Nostra wanted initially. But ultimately, they sort of lost that in translation. Uh, but probably the only family who kept it that way, Sicilian wise was Russell Buffalino. Uh, everybody that was involved in his family came from Montadoro. It's just reality. Uh, but there's always a beef, you know, oftentimes between Sicilians and Calabrians, which, you know, uh, what the huge issue was uh, between many guys, especially Frank Costello, who was Calabrian and, and that stuff goes back generations. It's just a bias against other, uh, Italians. So in any event, uh, 
as you know, Canada was always a bit wide open, and we know where the Papalia set up shop in Hamilton. Toronto was always sort of the hub uh, in which everybody wanted to get to because there were more rackets in availability. But the true geniuses were the ones who held on to the Niagara region and the line between the United States and Canada. Uh, and that was, it, it was, you know, that specific just because of imports and exports, uh, bootlegging, drugs, and more. The true power in Canada came from traditional rackets, but many got a head start through prohibition. And it's no different with Vincenzo Catroni. Uh, Vincenzo, or Vic, Catroni was born in Mamola, Calabria in 1911. He, along with his family, would immigrate from Italy to New York. And then after two, year, two years in New York, would then emigrate to Montreal. And they wouldn't get to Montreal until 1924. Uh, Catroni was 13 years of age at that point. And by all accounts, he was completely illiterate. Couldn't read, couldn't write, couldn't spell. So I imagine that school was probably not something he took a part in. At least I couldn't find any historical records to show that he even attended school, but I'm sure he did. But because of his illiteracy, I, I'm not sure that that was something that lasted very long. He was raised in the La Plateau Mount Royal region, uh, which was basically a poor Italian enclave in Montreal. The neighborhood was a rough one and the crime rates specifically there were worse than they were everywhere else. So by the time that the Catronis arrived, Montreal had become a really big staging point for bootlegging as Montreal at the time was the only place in Canada where prohibition didn't exist. Everywhere else in Canada, it was dry, except Montreal, which enabled criminals to use that as a staging point or an import-export point. Uh, it truly was the only place north of the Rio Grande where it was possible to buy and sell and drink alcohol. So you could understand from a criminal aspect anyway why Canada would have become a very pivotal place for alcohol especially with an organized crime. Those in Montreal didn't know what to, uh, excuse me, those in Montreal didn't have to do what American criminals did as far as manufacture it through stills. Uh, Angelo Bruno, uh, Carlo Gambino, and Dutch Schultz, you know, manufactured stills. It was just easier that way. Uh, while I'm positive that Vic Catroni tried school, it just wouldn't have been, I think it just would have been very difficult for him in, in all honesty. At one point or another, he attempts to become a carpenter like his father, but it just wasn't for him. And Catroni was looking for something else. In his early 20s, Catroni would stay out of, could not stay out of trouble. Uh, it seemed like wherever he went, he would take a pinch and get arrested. And that would continue through much of his uh, life. But he did have a, a run for a long time without that. Uh, through friends, Vic would meet a man by the name of Armand Corville. Uh, on the record, he was a wrestling promoter and a trainer. Uh, Corville was born in Montreal in 1910 and had a career in professional wrestling. Corville at one time, believe it or not, was a headlining wrestler for Silvio Sampson. Uh, and he at one point held the Canadian and Quebec mid mid heavyweight championship between 1932 and 1962. Sampson controlled most of the popular popular wrestling promotions in Quebec. Catroni thought wrestling might be fun. And so he joined a wrestling school, which Corville ran. That's how these two met. He would teach Catroni the ropes, literally, uh, but not just in the wrestling world, but in the mafia underworld of Canada. While the wrestling wasn't exactly profitable for Vic Catroni, Corville became what we call in the life a rabbi. Uh, Corville had deep ties to organized crime. Uh, at the end of the day, he was actually really a gangster and a racketeer uh, and used profits from his illegal activity to push wrestling. The perfect sort of cloak and dagger type of game. Uh, Corville had an interest in local gambling halls and in, uh, and over the years, history has sort of reinvented itself. Many have made claims that it was Vic Catroni who brought Corville into the fold and into organized crime. But in reality, it was actually the opposite. It was Corville who taught Catroni the ins and outs of the organized crime world. It was through Corville where Catroni began to be tutored in the art of organized crime. At some point, both men began to bootleg, setting up a base of operations for smuggling through contacts that Corville had. Catroni would take on, you know, various different pinches early on with Corville, but because of Corville's contacts, Catroni never got the hammer from the justice system. Uh, both he and Corville would begin to expand illegal businesses and would begin smuggling booze into the United States. Corville would teach a youthful Catroni that everything could be bought and paid for with an envelope. He taught Catroni how to corrupt 
cops, how to corrupt politicians, how to corrupt businessmen. And it was the price of just doing business to ensure that they would look the other way. In 1928, Vic Catroni would be arrested for the rape of a girl by the name of Maria Bresciano. Uh, he had proposed marriage. She had said no. And according to the police, he raped her as a result of that. He would be arrested for that, but those charges would be dropped allegedly because she finally agreed to marry him. Uh, by many accounts, it was actually Corville who paid everybody off to make sure that those charges went away. Can I prove it? No, but that's sort of the log line. Uh, Maria Bresciano and uh, Vic Catroni would end up getting married and they would have a baby girl by the name of Rosina. You might not know it, but the last name Bresciano should be ringing a bell in your ear. It should be. And if it's not, I'm about to tell you why. Uh, because Bresciano is a big famous name. Uh, the former wrestler in the WWF, now WWE, Dino Bravo. His real name was Adolfo Bresciano. Uh, and he would actually end up going to work for his uncle Vincenzo and would later be killed as a result of bad business acumen. So there is the connection between Dino Bravo and Vic Catroni. It was uh, Vic Catroni had married his sister's sister, making uh, Maria his aunt. So there you go. But we are going to talk about that later on in the series. So by the time 1930 came along, Vic Catroni and Corville made quite the pair from bootlegging to counterfeiting to theft to assaults. Catroni was proving to be somebody you didn't want to mess with. And Corville was the same exact arch archetype. Neither one of them uh, were soft. Both were proficient with their hands and did not hesitate uh, to handle business in a violent way. They didn't need to subcontract that out as both enjoyed the brutality on that side of the life. Both were feared on their own and together it was a scary team and they had a nasty reputation. Catroni's reputation allowed him to bounce at nightclubs and uh, very well to do night spots. It was known not just to viciously beat somebody up, but in one case pulled the eyes out of someone who got whippy with him at a club. Uh, you know, so you gotta, you gotta have a serious rage to rip somebody's fucking eyes out of their head if they insult you. Uh, and we know from the Papalia story, uh, what Catroni did that one night at a club. Remember he shoved a broken bottle into the guy's mouth and then curb stomped him just for extra measure. <laughs> uh, Corville knew how to bend politicians, uh, and he knew how to bend political parties. And in 1930, uh, in the 1930s, he and Catroni showed their prowess at controlling politics in a ferocious way. Corville had close friendships and contacts within the Liberal Party, and Corville believed in the Liberal Party and their beliefs, and anybody who got in the way would fucking regret it. Corville would tell a journalist that he was the police chief of the Liberal Party, and anything that he had to do, he would do legal or illegal. He just didn't give a fuck. Uh, Corville knew that controlling politics meant controlling the country and the city. Uh, so when Elections began to take place. Catroni and Corville would show up at voting stations and they would wield baseball bats uh, like like hitting a pinata in anybody who dared to vote against the Liberal Party because they were ferocious. The Liberal Party had hired them for these baseball beating baseball bat beatings. And even their opposition, who was the Union National Party, would hire them for the same sort of tactics. So they were acting on behalf of both parties and doing that. Catroni and Corville ensured for decades that politicians would bend over backwards to help them. Uh, they would force indictments and investigations to disappear the minute they started. So there was a benefit as to why they did that. They would then move on to gambling, loan sharking, and extortion, all traditional rackets of the mob, and then the money came pouring in. Catroni would form what was widely, widely considered, and, and I believe it to be, the first mafia family with any sort of power in Canada. He would also bring in Corville as his advisor almost immediately. In 1940, Canada began to round up Italians and anybody they thought that was associated with facet, excuse me, fascists uh, were arrested. We know that Papalia was rounded up as well as others, but Catroni wasn't because he could not be linked to the Sons of Italy, which seemed to be the focal point of the Canadian legislators. Uh, or it might just be that his insulation was protected because of his actions in the 1930s, with clubbing people with a baseball bat. <laughs> so in 1941, he begins to expand, and uh, next to him for the ride was Armand Corville. Uh, he begins to, as we said, expand into prostitution, gambling, extortion, and loan sharking. He opens up a hot nightclub called the Fasion Door and Cafe Royale. 
for the next 20 years, that nightclub would be the hottest place in Montreal. One of the more ingenious ideas that the two had was the prostitution rackets. Uh, the war, as the war drums would start for World War II, uh, both knew that U.S. servicemen would end up in Canada at some point, and they wanted to control the market on sex. Soldiers are going to want to get laid, so let's just control that. And they would op open up some three dozen brothels, and they would be right, because when the U.S. servicemen arrived, that's where they flocked to. They flocked to bars, to nightclubs, and to get laid. And it got so bad that the U.S. Army and U.S. Navy wanted to ban soldiers from going to Montreal because thousands were catching STDs. <laughs> oh, God. So while Corville and Catroni were beginning to rack up the money, they had eyes watching them. And those eyes would be Lucky Luciano and Meyer Lansky, uh, who were watching close on what was going on within Canada. Those outside of Montreal, who had been working loosely in the bootlegging rackets, realized that Montreal was the hub for a lot of action. And the American Mafia began to sense that Montreal would really be a money juggernaut for the Mafia. Uh, one thing that differentiated Catroni with other bosses, and you guys will find this very interesting, I did too, uh, but the one thing that differentiated Catroni from other bosses or people who would become bosses is that he aligned a lot with Luciano on beliefs that criminals were just criminals, and he didn't care about race, color, uh, whereas old bosses or the old mustache Pete's believed in Sicilian old world views. Catroni didn't care if you were Sicilian, Calabrian, Abruzzi. To him, money was green, and having that sort of Italian bigotry just hampered business. Uh, it was something that drew the ire of others, but Catroni just didn't give a fuck. Uh, he was very liberal in his viewpoints. Uh, he would have men of Sicilian origin in his crime family as well as others. But the one thing that he did and the one thing that, that eventually I found to be quite surprising is when he was cutting up his territory, his turf, he would put those from the same region in Italy and cruise together. So if you were from Napoli, everybody would be from Napoli. If you were from Sorrento, everybody would be Sorrento. Your captains would be from the same area. Um, and so his crews would operate uh, along geographical lines with each captain running a certain district in Montreal. And I'll give you a, for instance, uh, Luigi Greco was a Sicilian and he would run the West end of uh, Montreal and everybody within that crew would be Sicilian. Frank Catroni, who was, uh, you know, obviously from, uh, Calabria and, uh, and, uh, Vic's brother would run St. Laurent and everybody within that group was, uh, Andrangheta. Okay. Uh, Nicola Deloria, he was born in Canada, uh, but he had a background where his family lineage went back to Sorrento. So everybody in that crew was from that region geographically. Uh, you know, Paolo Violi was from Calabria. Uh, he served as an underboss, and then he had a subset of crew underneath him that was all from Calabria. And I think that the reason why Catroni did this was he was going to avoid the trappings of Italian bigotry. You know, that was a way to ensure there wouldn't be like this hatred because he knew that Sicilians felt a certain way uh, that, uh, you know, uh, uh, Calabrese felt a certain way. And the fact that they were an Andrangheta cell or an Andrina, the fact that they had Sicilian guys within their crime family and leaders says a lot. Because if you look at the Rizzutos, it wasn't the same. They did not do that at all. And no other crime family in Montreal has ever done that. He was the only one that ever did. And I think it was a smart move because it just avoided the trappings of, of uh, racial bigotry. Uh, Catroni trusted Corville so much, he made him his consigliere. And he makes William O'Bron, who served sort of kind of as a Meyer Lansky, uh, you know, from a financing standpoint. So as you see, Catroni valued intelligence and acumen and loyalty versus the ideal of being from the same town or province of Italy. And, and once again, it's, it's that sort of thinking along the lines of Luciano, that money is green and nothing fucking else matters. And that's the way that it should be. Uh, as we said, Vic would bring in his brother Frank into the mix. Uh, Frank was born in Montreal in 1931. And, you know, he was 20 years younger than his brother. Uh, and he would eventually step in and he would begin to make his way up the ranks of the mob underworld as well. And he wasn't the only one, as Giuseppe Catroni, their other brother, would also enter into un the underworld uh, and would be a force within his own right in mob circles. All three brothers in their own right were solid gangsters. 
all three of them were juggernauts. It wasn't just one. I mean, sometimes we see it in the life where a guy will have a younger brother. He's not as smart, kind of a dodo, whatever the case may be. But not in this case. All three were very, very, uh, what's the word? They've, they were very complete gangsters in every sense of the word. And neither of the three had any time or patience for bullshit. They were all violent. So you have to realize because, you know, some might say, well, what about Nick Rizzuto? And, and, you know, when he showed up, well, he didn't come to Montreal until 1954. And this was after, uh, this is after the Catroni sort of got their alliance with the Bonanno crime family. And there's just a lot of stuff that happens like in a, in a 10 year gap here. That's pretty insane. But, uh, like I said, Rizzuto came to Montreal in 54. And even when he did, he was subservient to Vic Catroni. The same thing Johnny Papalia was subservient to Vic Catroni. Uh, so Catroni really has the first, uh, you know, established family in Canada. Um, Catroni was way established when Johnny Papalia begins to make his waves and sort of his rise begins. But it wasn't until the mid-1950s that Papalia begins his ascension uh, to being a tough guy. And and that is only after coming into, into an agreement with the Bonanno crime family. And all that is, is Magadino and Banana or Bonanno and Magadino attempt it. Well, not even Bonanno, but it's Magadino attempting to control who he thinks the most powerful is so that he can compete with Joe Bonanno. And that's really what's, what's sort of going on uh, to be honest with you. Uh, and I may have said that wrong because I, sometimes I get clusterfucked. So uh, let me restate uh, both would end up becoming subservient to the Bonanno crime family uh, at the end of the day. But that's not the way it began because of all of them, the only one that stuff with, stuck with Buffalo was uh, uh, Johnny Papalia, to be honest with you. Uh, Vic Catroni knew having the first real established family in Montreal that he needed to have power uh, or at least some sort of consolidation or a partnership that he was seeing being wielded from New York. It's all about competition and who's backing you. And he wanted those connections. So while Luciano and others were watching close, what was going on in Montreal uh, and they valued what they were seeing, uh, there had to be a way to exploit Montreal for their own gain. Now, as we know, Luciano would be uh, basically exiled in 1946, but he had wanted to sta establish an American narcotics racket. Uh, and we know that there would be several meetings over the next few years, including one in December of 46 in Havana, Cuba, which was the early stages of narcotics transportation into the United States. And they needed a port very similar to Cuba that was a little closer to the United States. And that port would end up being Montreal. At least that was one of the minor discussions that they had with Toronto also having close proximity to the American border. It was something that they needed to consider and, and something that they sort of needed to map out and sort of figure out how they were going to do it. And that foundation uh, at the Havana conference was laid down that day at that, at that meeting uh, for the routes and there would be another meeting in 1951, which would change the trajectory of narcotics distribution, and it would change how powerful Vic Catroni would become in a short period of time. Uh, and, um, you know, it, it's it's one of those things where uh, there are – I never like to repeat myself. Like we've talked so much about the Havana Conference, the Acapulco meeting, and all of these other things, even the Atlantic City Conference and all of this – but the reason why we are going to cover those uh, next week is because I want people to understand that it wasn't just one meeting and everything was taken care of uh, because there were certain things that had to be done. They needed uh, their hooks into France. There was just a lot of networking that needed to go on. And those things take, unfortunately, years. Uh, and we will see, obviously, next week how that's going to sort of come into play. But the reason why I'm going to stop here, and I apologize that it's so short, but because we have to cover all three meetings and I don't want to like cover one meeting, stop, and then have to come back and regurgitate uh, all three meetings, uh, you know, the following week. Uh, but these meetings, like I said, are precisely important to Vic Catroni's story. So next week when we do come back, uh, we're going to discuss the Havana Conference in correlation to Montreal, then the 1951 meeting between Luciano and Vic Catroni. And that meeting was... Uh, formed to establish the American market and using Montreal and Ontario as a hub and how the mob can ex exploit the region fully. Uh, the Catronis will end up aligning themselves with the Bonanno crime family, the same 
uh, you know, as other crime families would do. But the difference is, is that the Bonanno Alliance won't last. Uh, Catroni wasn't a sucker. And I think that he could see the writing on the wall. And eventually the Rizzutos arrive in 54. And very quickly they become a juggernaut. And it would actually lead to a huge war where a lot of people were killed in a very relatively short period of time. And that country, uh, Canada, had never seen those kind of bodies and numbers. Uh, and they've never seen a war like that. Uh, currently, there is a war still going on. And it's still between Andrangheta and Sicilian factions. Uh, and this really, this shit really uh, peaked. Uh, it's bad now, of course. Uh, but it didn't peak until the 70s. And so next week we can come back. We're going to talk about all three meetings. Uh, what led to... Uh, those meetings, what the results of those meetings were, how Catroni would move into narcotics, how Papalia pretty much ended up working for Catroni and everybody else, but there would end up being problems between them, as we know, because we've talked about that before. Uh, and it's really just all about Catroni's expansion. Uh, but once the Rizzutos arrive, it, it gets really interesting really quick uh, because there's going to be some bad blood. And so for all of this, thought process that Catroni had about, you know, Sicilians are right, not a big deal. Well, now it's a get now it's about to get really ugly for that reason. Uh so it's amazing that somebody could have a philosophy and run their family that way. And then when a Sicilian family moves, starts to move into your turf and territory and create problems, how quick you want to kill all of them. So that's what we're going to cover uh next week. And I hope you come back because I think the second second episode, excuse me, is going to be a lot better, a lot longer, and it's going to be uh, completely in depth. I just, you know, I could have gone for an extra 45 minutes on this, but I didn't want to include the three meetings and then have to come back and do it again next week. So that's what we're going to do next week. Uh, this has been a long show. Uh, and I hope you all stuck around for it. And I apologize for losing my shit, but I just reached the point where enough. Is enough. And welcome back to mob talk radio. At this point, we are going to get to the Catroni crime family part three. And we're just going to dive right into it. So as we talked last week, the Catronis were really first established, the, the first established crime family in Canada. So not to confuse you, uh, because there were many criminal gangs and families, but the Catronis were the first to be fully recognized by the American Mafia. When we discussed Johnny Papalia, we went through his legacy and we know that he himself uh, was aligned with the Magadino crime family based out of uh, Buffalo. Uh, Johnny would have, you know, he could have flexed his muscles, but he didn't rather he, you know, was instructed at that time to just get along with everybody else, be a voice. And I think looking back, that was more Magadino asking him to lay low and for good reason. So while Papalia would become a force to be reckoned with in his own right, flexing too early against the Catronis would have been a bad move for him because it would have created friction which would have led to fighting over turf and, and, and all kinds of problems. Uh, Magadino was more about the long game than he was the short game. Uh, and looking back, I believe it was probably a wise move to slow it down. But in doing so, uh, you know, he allowed the Catronis to, to really monopolize things, to grow and to consume everything. Uh, so much, though, uh, that Papalia would be limited in his abilities to stretch out without creating eyebrows raising. And that move essentially would render Papalia in many ways a two-trick pony. Uh, and I don't mean that in a negative way, but when you have two families represented by the American Mafia, and specifically the commission, you know, sitting back is something that you cannot afford to do for too long because everybody around you will become more powerful. Uh, and Papalia was, you know, an even keel guy for the most part. He was a nut job, <laughs> a violent guy. Uh, and what I mean by that was he learned a lot from Vic Catroni. He learned a lot from watching him and emulating him to some extent. And while it served its purpose, it would also handicap him towards the end of his life. Uh, and I totally understand why. And, and maybe now is a good time to answer this before we get back to the Catroni crime family. But, but let me ask this question or opine on this for just one second. Why would Canada, who rightfully established their own rackets and turf, be beholden to the American mafia? Why not mix together and tell New York to go fuck themselves? Uh, together, they surely could have been strong, right? And I mean by everybody in Canada getting together. The easiest answer to that is very, very simple. It came down to money. 
Uh, Canada needed the exports to reach American shores, and we know who ran those. Just as Canada needed American imports as well, cigarettes and more, it was a situation where both needed to capitalize on what they wanted. And where the rub comes in is the taxing of those rackets. The American mafia was much bigger. They were much stronger. They were more powerful. And their ability to infiltrate unions in Tammany Hall and politicians was just more expansive and immense than Canadian mobsters could actually do at the time. Uh, There was just basically no way for them to tell American bosses to go fuck themselves and not have consequences as resulting from that. But there was also a benefit to that arrangement. And it simply meant that the American markets opened to them, to those guys in Canada. It offered more work, more schemes, more money. And while some may say, well, but the American mafia was still in their pockets to a large extent, and that would be true. But now they had representation, which simply meant if they needed to go to war or if they needed to lean on somebody hard, they had the full extent and power of an American family whose numbers tripled what other smaller criminal organizations had at the time. So it offered power and it offered money and it offered prestige. Uh, I don't think at the end of the day, guys like Vic Catroni gave two fucks about their associations, because if you know anything about the Catronis, you know how this story is going to end. And they would find that just aligning themselves with one family wouldn't be stabilizing in any sense for very long. It worked for a while until it didn't. And then, well, it was off to the races. And the last thing I want to remind you of before we get going is the stance that Vic Catroni had on Sicilians versus Calabrians, uh, those from northern Italy. Uh, He didn't see it as a problem. And he didn't want to scrutinize men on their backgrounds or ethnic or traditional lines. He knew enough not to do that because he knew it created problems in Italy. It created problems back in New York in the early days, especially when you look at uh, Masseria and Maranzano, which is why he specifically aligned men of regionality backgrounds together in hopes that there would be no spillover, no issues and stuff like that. So while Catroni had that mindset, uh, because under his full reign, it would be all systems go. But those very ideals, the regional bigotry would come back to haunt the Catroni crime family and would fully and almost completely decimate them. So while he had this great idea and it, 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 it was a smart thing for him to do, it was something that eventually was going to root its ugly head and create a lot of problems. So as we said last week, there would be three meetings that would take place in the coming years that would establish several factors uh, and some big events would take place and that would change the trajectory of the mafia, historically speaking. As we know, Luciano would be exiled to Italy and we know the reasons why, because we've discussed that a billion times on this show. So when Luciano arrives back in Italy, he had really no designs on quitting the life whatsoever, but he wanted to control narcotics in the United, in the United States. Luciano had been a narcotics trafficker for 40 years at that point. And he began trafficking in his teens, and he didn't stop until his heart did in January of 62 at the Naples International Airport. Ultimately, what Luciano wanted was complete control of the narcotics market and the rackets. Because he couldn't come back into the United States, he called for a meeting in Havana, Cuba, slated for December of 1946. And we've discussed that meeting at length, and I don't really want to rehash all that again. But the main purpose of the meeting was narcotics trafficking. Uh, His plan was simple. Bring heroin from North Africa, use Cuba as a base of operations, and eventually they wanted to manufacture in Cuba, but the drugs would flow from North Africa to Sicily to Cuba, then to Florida, Montreal, etc. He didn't want narcotics directly shipped to Florida, so everything would come through ports that the mafia fully controlled. That's why New Orleans, Norfolk, Virginia, Tampa, and New York City were chosen. Now, some of you may say, wait a minute, Virginia? We've never heard that. But yes, those ports were fully controlled by the Aragona crime family. Uh, The Gambino crime family has long held Virginia Beach as their turf, while small guys like John Aragona and Eddie Garcia controlled everything for 50 years. Uh, And I mean everything. Both are deceased. Now, uh, I knew both of them uh, through other people. Uh, especially because they were both at Virginia Beach and I lived there at one point, but also Sicilian Cosa Nostra in the 70s through the 90s, the Catone crew ran about every racket and distribution network Virginia has ever seen. Uh, so to say that Virginia doesn't have that is a little null and void. Uh, 
But in any event, Luciano put Joe Biondo in charge of managing the Mangano side of the narcotics rackets in the East Village would become the epicenter of drug distribution. Uh, really, actually, about four blocks from where I live now is, is really where they set everything up. While we know that Luciano was setting up the basic structure, it really doesn't take complete hold immediately. Granted, narcotics began to flow. And Luciano's idea was to have Sicilians control the export to Cuba and further. It was a way for bosses to insulate themselves from being hands-on uh, and basically leaving oversight to underlings. Now, where this gets a little dicey, because in doing research, uh, you often find that dates on government documents and online seem to overlap each other and don't make a lot of sense. So let me explain. In some documents, it said that Luciano met with Vic Catroni in 1951 about Montreal becoming a part of the major exporter of heroin and cocaine and that Luciano wanted Vic Catroni to sort of oversee that and handle that. Uh, then it said that there's a meeting in October of 57 in Sicily about narcotics arrangements. It's at this meeting where allegedly Lucky Luciano puts the Bananos in control of narcotics in Montreal and Bonanno assigns Galante to be in charge of that. However, Galante arrives in Montreal in 1953, some four years before that Sicilian meeting. So yes, I know it gets confusing. So I think logically, a lot of the dates that you're going to find online just aren't accurate. And I know factually that the meeting took place uh, in Sicily in October of 57. And I know that because the government surveilled that meeting. However, Carmine Galante is expelled from Canada in 1956. So I tend to believe that the bad information can really throw some of you off. Factually, I do not believe that the Sicilian meeting had anything to do with Galante heading to Montreal because he had already been thrown out by that time. So I don't want you guys, you know, going on the internet and getting all confused about the dates because there's too much bad information out there. And, and this is the reason why I brought this up is because people will go to Wikipedia. They see one thing. They'll go to like some mob authors page and, and people just don't bother to look at the dates and say, how is that possible if Galante wasn't even in Canada anymore? Like that doesn't make any fucking sense. So what we do know for certain is that Vic Catroni meets with Luciano to some extent. Uh, and we don't know 100% for 100% certainty how this was obtained or acquired, but even so they did meet uh, to some degree anyway. And Luciano basically explained, um, and we know that because Catroni was in Cuba, that they wanted to move into the American market and that Montreal was to be a hub and they wanted Vic Catroni to be involved. It was explained to Catroni that the Bananos would be in charge of the distribution and that Carmine Galante would be sent to handle the day-to-day -day operations of that. Uh, Galante would arrive in Montreal and the narcotics would begin to move. Uh, so really the dates don't fucking matter. We, we know these, that this happened, but the, the 57 meeting does not coincide with reality. Let's just be honest. So Catroni and Galante spend many days together, but what Carmine Galante begins to do is to shake down gambling dens. It would be basically overtaking uh, businesses in Montreal, which truly uh, would have belonged to Catroni, but his hands were tied because he was under the Bonanno administration. But more importantly, uh, the commission. Uh, Galante, according to reports, was collecting some $50 million a year for the Bonanno's just in gambling profits alone in Montreal. So if Vic Catroni didn't like Carmine Galante or didn't like being subservient to the Bonanos, um, it didn't really matter because working with Galante and the Bonanos actually helped his career in many ways. Uh, Galante was just very powerful and he didn't budge when it came to violence. With Galante's power, it automatically elevates uh, Vic Catroni in the underworld and it makes him look good to the new york mafia and to the commission because he's getting along he's helping and etc and he's learning stuff from galante too so while catroni likely uh could have done many of the same things that galante was doing galante just had more moxie and by proxy that rhymes moxie and proxy uh catroni reaped the benefits of everything that galante was doing to make matters a little more entertaining <laughs> Uh, Galante essentially makes himself the boss of Montreal and inducts Catroni into the Bonanno crime family, making him his underboss. Now, ultimately, Catroni would be dropped down to a captain, but at one point he was Galante's underboss. While things kept moving right along, Galante's antics were getting out of control. 
Uh, it wasn't sloppy as it was just fucking barbaric. Let's be honest. And the Canadian government knew who he was and they didn't want him there. And this is sort of where the speculation starts. Someone who was obviously providing information to the Canadian government. I mean, we know that has to be the case. And you had your likely culprits uh, from Stefano Magadino, who definitely would have had an interest to get Galante the fuck out of Canada. And you also had Vic Catroni, who could have been a guy who could use that to his advantage if he wanted to. But do I think that either one provided that information? No, I don't think so. I just think that Galante had a fucking hair trigger. Uh, and here's a guy not from Canada who's being said to, to be doing all of this stuff. So Galante gets tossed out on his ass and Bonanno then sends Salvatore Giglio to operate Montreal on his behalf for the Bonanno crime family. So with an ever expanding drug route, the mafia was always looking for easier ways uh, for narcotics distribution. And we're always looking for ways that negated the long miles between ports, the shorter the distance, the better it would be. Uh, and so Luciano was truly looking for a way to make the process less complicated. Uh, Sicily has been used in a port uh, in, in many ways throughout the years, but they wanted to make it a hub for narcotics. They also wanted another destination in Europe to make the move from Italy to other countries into Europe, into Cuba. Uh, but most importantly, uh, he wanted a split. Everything coming from Indochina and Turkey was ex it's expensive, right? And they had to refine the product. So there's all this money going out, going out, going out. So everything would move literally from east to west. So if you want to pull up an American map really quick, a map of uh, or a map of the world, just look at Indochina, look at Russia, look at China, look at Turkey, look at Italy, look at France and go from literally east to west. And this will give you more of a, a visual to what I'm talking about. Uh, where am I? So everything from Indochina to Turkey was, like I said, expensive, and they had to still refine the product. They're getting the opium, but they still have to refine it. So rather than go to 15 different places and risk a lot of things, they do something a little different. So everything would move east to west, Cuba and Canada. So you essentially have the product hitting Cuba, which is closer to Florida, uh, from north to south to Midwest via Canada. But the mob would never ever see Cuba become the destination that they hoped it would be. Refinement was the ultimate goal because it's cost effective, it's less risk, but Cuba would never be. And we know all the reasons why Cuba would never be. So what Luciano needed was a middleman, so to speak, and he would find that in Sicily as a way station. But the refinement came in the form of the French mafia. Since the 1930s, France has been a place where heroin was being manufactured in labs. Opium had long been transported from Afghanistan to Pakistan, Lebanon, into Turkey, and then to Marseille, France, where the opium would be converted into heroin. So in October of 57, Luciano would host a meeting wanting to capitalize on the Marseille labs. This meeting took place at the Hotel des Palmes between October 12th to the 16th of 1957. Now, People may argue about this meeting even taking place, and there's a lot of reasons for this uh, because, you know, uh, people argue whether or not what the real juxtaposition or what the real reason for this meeting was, and people have said that it didn't exist, but we know that it did exist because Tommaso Buschetta, who became one of the biggest rats, uh, was there. Uh, however, when he was questioned, he refused to admit or acknowledge that heroin was on that agenda. But most people believe that that, in fact, was one of the biggest reasons for the meeting as Luciano wanted to set up a network where Sicily would receive opium via their support through contacts and then moved from Sicily to France without interruption. Other things like cocaine would be shipped directly from Sicily into the United States with New York being the destination. And we know from the Papalia series that we did that they did, in fact, supply cocaine to New York City. And a bunch of times uh, they got caught doing so, which led to not only some pretty vicious murders, uh, but to a lot of arrests as well, which included a Papalia arrest. So what Luciano wanted was the Sicilian mafia to get in the distribution network. And he also, uh, you know, wanted... Uh, uh, there to be way stations of sorts. So while the Sicilians 
were already moving in narcotics distribution going back to the 1940s, they were always sort of a second tier group when it came to distribution. So in other words, they were smaller players in a much bigger game. And what Luciano wanted was he wanted Sicily to be a specific staging point with shorter routes from east to west with less stops. Those present were Joe Bonanno, Carmine Galante, John Bonaventure, Frank Garofalo, Lucky Luciano, Santos Sorge, John DeBella, Vito Vitali, and Gaspari Magadino. On the Sicilian side of the table were Salvatore Greco, his cousin, also named Salvatore Greco, Giuseppe Genco Russo, Vincenzo Rimi, Filippo Rimi, Angelo Lobarbara, Gaetano Badalamente, Toto Minore, uh, let's see, Cesar Marzella, Rosario Mancino, Tommaso Buscetto, uh, and Giacchino Pinino. Those were the guys that were at this meeting. As we said, we know the meeting took place uh, as Luciano really at that point was being stalked by the police everywhere he went, and the police surveilled the meetings. Reports of those meetings were actually found, as we said, I think a couple of weeks ago, buried in a filing cabinet in a basement in Palermo. So the meeting was to solidify a partnership with the Sicilian Mafia, and it was also at this meeting where the American Mafia helped the Sicilians organize their own commission, uh, which they did as a result of that meeting. The Sicilians prior did not have a commission at all, uh, and that commission would not be really sort of officially working until 1958, with the Sicilians naming Salvatore Greco as the head of that commission. And then what the Sicilians do is they align, you ready for this? 46 different families in Palermo alone. 46 families in Palermo. We have five in New York City. They had 46 in Palermo. <laughs> that should tell you the size, just the size difference. Uh, the one thing that the Sicilians did differently in this particular case was they refused to allow men within the families with titles to be on the commission. If you were a captain, you could not be on the commission. And the reason why they did that was they wanted just soldiers. Because if you're a captain, you have something to gain by being on that commission. And they basically wanted to ensure that nobody could monopolize the situation. So if guys, are, two captains are in business together, they just don't, they want it to be fair across the board. And they would use that commission in two ways, to handle disputes and to green light violence. Uh, another stark difference is that they could order the murder of police, attorneys, and judges and officials, but only with permission. The American mafia never did that. They would never, ever green light that. That's the difference between Sicilians and Americans. Uh, you know, so when you think about the American Mafia, any murder that would take place from one family to another had to be agreed upon. By 1963, all hell would break loose due to a drug dispute in Sicily. So rather than the commission acting appropriately in, in Sicily to show, I don't want to say rookie, because that's but but to show that it was such a new revolutionary idea. Rather than deal with it responsibly and call an end to it because there was a dispute between two people between drugs and all hell breaks loose and people start shooting and killing each other. Rather than can the commission come in and say, okay, you did something bad. You did something bad. Let's sit down. Let's figure it out. Let's end this shit. They got involved in pick sides. And the minute they did that, you might as well throw the commission idea out the fucking window because then it became AK-47 time. I'm just telling you, that's just how it went. So- in 1957, a lot of things go, go down. Uh, the first, uh, as we know, would be the Sicilian Summit, which we just discussed. The second, uh, there was a municipal election being held in Canada, and Vincenzo Catroni, who had learned years ago about the controlling politics, joins forces with the Union National Government of Premier Maurice de Plessis, who was squaring off with Jean Drapeau, for the mayor, mayor, oh, excuse me, the the mayor, the mayor candidacy of Montreal, mayoral. Uh, Catroni was, you know, um, and I love how I'm going to phrase this. Catroni was not immune to getting jiggy with it. You know what I mean? He he would control politics. He'd use a pipe. He'd use a bat. He didn't give a fuck. So, like I said, he wasn't immune to getting jiggy with it, and he already had a beef with Jean Drapeau uh, because back in 1954, Drapeau was running for mayor. And Catroni used violence and stuffed ballot boxes uh, to try to fuck him out of winning uh, the the election to become mayor. And it was an effort to fuck Drapeau, 
who was a reformist that Catroni couldn't stand. Drapeau would win the election regardless of everything Catroni did, and his first act was to appoint an incorruptible <laughs> police chief by the name of Roy Pax Plant. Uh, and then he makes him the chief of police of Montreal. Plant is the one who went to the government to bend them at the knees to deport Carmine Galante. So Pax is a, a fucking, uh, he's going to be a problem. He's a Johnny Law guy. He's now the chief of police. Now politics are going to change. And Catroni's just not down with that. So in 1957, Drapeau is running for re-election. His opponent, as we said, was Maurice Duplessis. Drapeau, uh, who is driving his car down the street, when he is forced off the road by a car filled with Catroni associates. Days later, his campaign headquarters was destroyed. Weeks after, weeks later, Ruben Levesque had the living shit beat out of him by Catroni men using pipes and more. And Levesque was the actual president of the anti-corruption group, the Civic Action League. So this is Catroni trying to control politics. Now, because Catroni felt that the Plessis couldn't win, what they end up doing is backing former liberal MP Santo Fournier. Catroni ensured that 20,000 false ballots would stuff the box. To nobody's shock, Fournier wins, and Depro, uh, excuse me, uh, Drapeau is out on his ass. Fournier's first move was going to Pax Plant and telling him, uh, you know, the plant was the uncorruptible cop, and he, he basically walks in and tells him, go fuck yourself. You're out of a job. You're done. Fires him on the spot. Fournier then replaces Plant with someone less abject to just being honest. So they put their own guy in. Plant is not happy about what happens, and he begins to make overtures to the press. Stupid fucking thing to do. Uh, and shortly after hearing, shortly after Catroni hears about Plant, you know, swearing revenge and wanting publicity over his firing, Catroni says, all right, we're going to put a contract out on his life. Kill this motherfucker. News would cycle back to Plant, who basically shit his pants and he flees to Mexico. <laughs> and he ends up hiding out in a little small village, a Mexican village for a long time. So with corruption back in swing in Montreal, Bonanno's chief, Giglio, who we talked about earlier, he ends up getting tossed out of Montreal because it's found that he took a trip to Cuba and he returned with cigars and he did not claim them at customs. That got him thrown out of the fucking country. Uh, it's a pathetic way to oust somebody, but in all reality, the government was just trying to get rid of Joe Bonanno and anything that was relegated to him. Uh, and here's what's interesting. Bonanno then names uh, Vic Catroni the head of the Montreal Mafia. Uh, why he didn't do that after Carmine Galante kind of confuses me a little bit, but that left Catroni to everything. Uh, whatever Galante had expanded into becomes Vic Catroni's. Uh, if he had ever been skeptical or bitter about Bonanno's choices, uh, they had just paid off in a major way for him. Catroni would become then the most powerful mobster in all of Canada. While that title or the description might be what Catroni wanted, the reality is he was still taking orders from New York. Granted, you know, Catroni in his own right was a powerhouse, but how much neutrality does one truly have when you're subservient to another group? Once Vic takes over, he begins his own rise and changes one of the standards in his family. You could not become a made member within his crime family until five years of being on the streets. Uh, smart rule. I've always said I would do seven, but he wants guys to prove their moxie. So while Catroni would then add rackets, he would control the market and oversee narcotics. You have to understand, and perhaps uh, a little math will make the question that we posed at the beginning of this show a little more obvious when we lamented about why Catroni would want those friendships and why he would allow New York to sort of bark. And to show you how the money flow went, there's something that happens. Uh, Catroni had four guys that handled money laundering and loan sharking for him. Uh, the government had actually raided one of these accounts, one of four. Okay, so when I tell you these numbers, it's going to blow your fucking mind. Okay, what they found in this bank account showed $83 million. Then it showed a subtraction of $50 million. And that was the kick up from Montreal to New York. 83, 83 million in one account. 
in one fucking account. So if you do the math, you have you ha- you have to justifiably think that let's just say that each account, four accounts, had eighty million dollars in it. So that's eighty million dollars times four accounts. That's three hundred and thirty-two uh, million dollars total. This means the mafia was essentially taking two hundred million dollars of that a year, which meant the Catroni profit was one hundred and thirty-two million dollars a year. And this is in what the sixties? That's fucking. That is an insane amount of money. An insane amount of money. And now you see why American bosses wanted Montreal so fucking bad. And you can also see why Magadino was so fucking irate with Joe Bonanno doing what he did. He wanted to cut of that action. They saw the money that could be made. And with the American mafia being uber powerful, guys like Catroni had really no choice. Catroni would continue to expand and he would begin to slowly back away from the day-to-day operations. And what he does is he puts his brother Frank, who was 20 years younger than him, in charge of the day-to-day operations. Now, Frank Catroni was born in Montreal in 1931. By most accounts, Frank was a lot like his older brother Vince, uh, Vic. However, he was more apt to be violent than Vic was. And that's saying something, because Vic was pretty fucking violent. Uh, he would follow his brother into the life. And he would be handed different operations to run. His specialty really was narcotics. In 1950, he would take a pinch on stolen goods and would head to prison for a short stint. July 24th of 56, he would be arrested for taking part in a massive brawl in which he wielded a lead pipe and hurt and hurt nearly half a dozen people. In 1960, he would be arrested again for con- carrying a concealed 38, and that charge would be concealing a deadly weapon. And while he was out on bail, he led 30 men to the Chez Paris Cabaret and demolished the whole entire inside because they weren't kicking kicking up to the Catronis. And he would be arrested for that and only fined $200. On July 1st of 1966, he would rent a house on 5146 Trans Island Street, which was directly across the street from the Deckery Boulevard City and District Savings Bank. Paul Decimer, along with his three sons, Mike, Paul, and Pierre, along with Joe Horvath, were all members of the West End gang, and they began to dig a tunnel from the basement of the house underneath the street, and it backed up right to the bank vault, and it's the house that Frank rented. Classic. March 31st of 67, all the five men were arrested in the tunnel that they had begun to dig. They were nearly at the vault door. They would all be arrested, and Catroni would be charged with conspiracy to commit robbery under the grounds that he had had to have known that the tunnel was being dug. When brought to trial, his co-defendants refused to accept a plea deal from the Crown. They refused to talk about Catroni, and he would skate from those charges. And the reason why I want to mention Frank is because he's about to take over the day-to-day operations of this crime family. And things are about to get very sketchy very quickly. They're going to end up having a problem, not just from, from within, but also from the outside. And so when we come back next week, there will be problems between a maid member and their family by the name of Niccolo Rizzuto. That's right. Niccolo Rizzuto got his start in the Catroni crime family as a soldier and associate. They're going to have a massive problem with a French Canadian gangster named Richard Blass, who didn't fear anybody at all and wasn't afraid to take the first shot and didn't fear a fucking soul. Joe Bonanno is really going to put the Catronis in a very bad situation, not just with the commission, but all five crime families. And then there's going to be the rise of a guy by the name of Paolo Violi, who began one way as a stand-up family guy to forming a massive Napoleon complex and wanting everything for himself, even getting caught on over 400 wiretaps trashing the Catronis, both Frank and Vic. The Catronis had come so far, but everything is about to crumble in a classic. show. So we're going to get into the Catroni crime family. I think we're going to have one more next week, and then we'll move on to another family. Uh, and as we talked to last week, uh, Vic Catroni, for the most part, it was all systems go. Uh, 
And as his family grew bigger and bigger, he began to hand over the day-to-day operations at first to his younger brother, Frank. Now, Frank, who was a lot like Vic in many ways, was really only boss in name uh, because behind the scenes, Vic was still sort of, well, he was controlling all the shots. So while institutionally, uh, you know, Vic had some old world ideas, uh, he learned a lot from the history in Italy as well as history in, in New York, and that old lines of bigotry were something that his family needed to avoid. But the reality is, in this life that we talk about so much on this show, it, it doesn't take very much for the crate of apples to go bad and to go bad very quickly. Uh, not to foreshadow too much here, but anytime you have a group whose ideals are all surrounded by ego, greed, and power, there's always going to be someone in the group who looks further down the line at the day that they can either, uh, you know, by politicking or by murder can take over a crime family. Uh, we've seen it a million times. Cosa Nostra is not immune to this idea at all. You know, ambition can be a very dangerous thing in the hands of somebody who is only loyal to themselves at the end of the day. And you don't have to go too far back in to, to see sort of history's representations of that. Luciano, ring any bells? Uh, and that's truly the best example. While there are dozens that we can mention, Luciano foresaw what the mafia could be uh, in the hands of someone just not necessarily thinking of just themselves. Initially, everything Luciano was wanted was for him, but it was collective for the group. Uh, I could see Luciano's viewpoint. You know, if we continue down this path, we never evolve. We never reach a point where we control everything. Old world bosses like Masseria and Maranzano, they they weren't forward thinkers. They thought about right then and there what was best for them in their pockets. It was about what they had, not about what they could achieve or what they wanted to achieve or what they wanted the representation to be down the line. They were more mentally focused on themselves and nobody else which is one of the reasons why Luciano overthrowing them was relatively easy for him in the grand scheme of things. By the time they began to see him for who he was, it was way too fucking late. He was three steps ahead. Even I admit, you know, uh, there's a wide gap between this example and the distinction versus a a subplot to today's stories. Uh, Vito Genovese was hell-bent on his own desires. He pulled the coup. But in reality, did it work? Sure, he got his name on the board. But what, but, uh, you know, and he got what he wanted. But how long did that truly last? Just for about a minute. Uh, for some odd reason, uh, you know, and, and walk with me very slowly on this one because I don't want to confuse you. But if your entire goal is one thing and you're not thinking past that one thing, then you're going to be pigeonholed by it. Okay, it's just as simple as that. Uh, Vito Genovese had no further plan. He passed controlling the commission. Uh, That's all he wanted. He wanted to control the commission. He wanted to be the man on the hill. But suddenly he's blind to the soldiers that are standing outside of the gates. Anastasia, same same sort of way. He never saw it coming. Carlo Gambino, for example, allowed Genovese to use him to get where he needed to go. But Gambino had vast ideas. He had plans. He was six steps down the road. He knew where he wanted to go and he knew how to get there. Now, had Gambino just wanted to run his own family and that was all it was, then he might not have lasted from 1957 to 76. He wanted the commission. He wanted the Eastern Seaboard. He wanted the unions. He wanted construction. He wanted everything. And he wanted to be the most powerful guy. And there's nothing wrong with having a singular idea of being the most powerful guy. But you have to do other things to get there. But Gambino also made sure that he put those in charge uh, to help him achieve that. So he put like-minded individuals. He didn't ignore the needs of the many versus the needs of the one. Okay. Uh, So today there is going to be a situation of sorts that someone within the Catroni crime family is going to eye things or at least eye the things that he wants for himself and a revolt of sorts will begin along the old world lines that Vic Catroni did not want. He went out of his way to align crews and captains within the crime family on the lines of lineage to avoid those trappings and those problems. But as you will see, it's not going to last. 
Paolo Violi was born in uh, Sinopoli, Calabria, in February of 1931. The Violis were a powerful mafia clan in Calabria, and Violi's father, Domenico, was a boss back in Italy. But Paolo would emigrate to southern Ontario, Canada in 1951. The main reason why he leaves Italy to begin with was because he was getting arrested nonstop, and the Italian authorities labeled him as a menace to society and a menace to Italy at large. And Violi was getting harassed nonstop in Italy, so he leaves for greener pastures. As we said, he would immigrate uh, and would settle in Toronto by the age of 20. He was dirt poor, didn't have much money to his name, which led him to end up sharing a room with someone who was an active member of what would become the French Connection. And this would lead Violi to hang out in certain circles. In 1955, just four years after arriving in Canada, he gets into an argument with a parking in a parking lot with a Calabrian immigrant. And Violi, who was one never to back down from a fight, gets into it with a guy by the name of Natale Brigante. Uh, the fight would escalate and Brigante would pull a switchblade. He would stab Violi in the chest just below his heart, almost killed him. Violi pulls out a snub nose 38 and shoots him four times in the fucking face. <laughs> Albeit, you know, that's the version that he gave police. Uh, Brigante would die on the spot and Violi would be arrested for murder. At the trial, he would plead not guilty as he was simply only defending himself. And the jury would agree in all those charges he would be acquitted of. The actual reason for the altercation uh, to begin with was that both Brigante and Violi were pimps and they were fighting over control of some women. And it just escalated, and many in law enforcement always believed that Violi, in some sort of capacity, was ordered to kill Bragante. Uh, his first foray into the life would be with the Lupino crime family. Uh, I couldn't find a whole lot of information about that, but it's long been asserted that he got his start with Giacomo Lupino, and it's through Lupino that he meets Vic Catroni. Violi's father, Domenico, was close friends with Domenico going back to the old country. So not soon. Uh, later, Domenico would immigrate to the United States, settling in Parma, Ohio. Uh, going in uh, with the Lupino crime family, it was a good move for at the time for Violi, as the Lupinos were sort of a factional wing of the Magadino crime family, uh, but staying basically in the Hamilton area, uh, you know, for the time being. But just isolating yourself in the Hamilton area just wasn't going to work. Everybody has to expand, right? So in the early 1960s, Violi would be used to transport illegally distilled booze between Ontario and Montreal. In 1963, Violi was asked by Lupino to head to Montreal because Johnny Papalia, who was a new upstart in the area, they just didn't want things, you know, escalating and things were already unsteady. Lupino didn't feel like keeping uh, Violi and Hamilton would end very well for anybody as Johnny Papalia uh, was a killer, as was Violi. Uh, and they just didn't want that to erupt. So Violi would leave Hamilton settling in Montreal, where he would begin to work directly for Vic Catroni in several different capacities. Catroni and Violi would become very close, almost like brothers. Vic Catroni would end up uh, standing in as Violi's best man when Paolo marries Giacomo Lupino's daughter, Grazia Lupino. So there's your family connection. So as Violi went to work for Catroni, which Lupino supported, uh, he gets a little frayed when Joe Bonanno's son, Bill Bonanno, arrives in Montreal to speak with Catroni, who took Violi to the meeting with him. It's been alleged that Lupino was not happy about losing Violi to the Catroni crime family, but the bigger issue was that Stefano Magadino saw that as a threat. And Lupino would step in and reassure Magadino that Violi was a good guy, he was married to his daughter, and that this was just business, uh, and, and you shouldn't, don't, don't worry about it. Violi had gone basically from answering essentially to Stefano Magadino to Joe Bonanno. And so you could see where Magadino would have a beef with this. But Violi quickly became super dependable, and Catroni saw Violi as the counterpart to himself. Catroni needed a Calabrian to even out the power structure of other Sicilian captains within their crime family. Catroni would make Violi a captain, and it counterbalanced the structure with the likes of Sicilians like Luigi Greco, Niccolo Rizzuto, who had a lot of power and respect. Uh, Rizzuto's flanks were strong with Luigi Greco, Niccolo Rizzuto, Frank Catroni, uh, Paolo Violi, and Niccolo Delorio. So once Violi settles in Montreal, he opens up the self-named Reggio Bar in the St. Uh, Leonard area. 
Uh, it was a basic mafia club where conversations were had, collections were dropped off, and more. A guy by the name of William Obi Abrant would be brought in to handle the bookmaking network in the Ottawa Hall area, and he would bring in around $50,000 a day, and 25% of that would be kicked up to Violi because he was using Violi's bar to handle the bets. Uh, Abrant's main role in the family was basically a Meyer Lansky. He was a bookmaker, and he, he knew how to launder money, and that was his main position within the Catroni crime family. Uh, like I said, look at him as Meyer Lansky for them. Uh, Abrant was insanely ins respected and valued within the Catroni crime family, especially when at the Montreal Expo in 1967, he obtained contracts for meat and vending machines for the Catroni crime family. Keep in mind, all that meat was fucking tainted. <laughs> um, but as we said, Catroni would hand the day-to-day -day operations to his brother, Frank, uh, and he would spend a lot of time between the office and his lavish home that he built in 1959. And the house is like massive. If you guys can, can find photos of the house, I've seen them. Uh, it was just ridiculously huge. Uh, it was marble floors, you know, large, expansive rooms, and it overlooked the St. Lawrence River. Uh, just beautiful, beautiful big home. However, in 1964, some bad shit goes down. Uh, and that would affect a lot of different things. And as you know, historically speaking, Joe Bonanno acting along with Joe Magliacco formed an agreement of sorts anyway to kill the entire commission and take over Cosa Nostra. The plan would be unveiled only because Magliacco handed the hits to Joe Colombo, who in turn, as we know, basically rats out Magliacco and Bonanno and informs the commission of what's going on behind the scenes. The commission who wants, ans who wants answers they demand that both Joe Bonanno and Joe Magliacco appear before the commission and answer for this. As we know, Bonanno would flee and take off to Montreal, leaving Joe Magliacco to fend for himself. Magliacco could and should have been killed for what he did, but the commission instead fined him and threw him out of the mafia because they felt that Joe Bonanno uh, was the guy who had more power, more to gain than Magliacco, and that Magliacco likely was just sort of a pawn in the plot uh, and Bonanno stood the, the most to gain. And I think the fact that Magliacco went to the meeting, considering he knew the shit he was <laughs> in trouble for, and he knew what the outcome could have been, they saw it as at least he showed respect by answering for it and telling the truth, whereas Bonanno ran like a fucking coward. So uh, for Catroni, Bonanno coming to hide in Montreal presented a huge fucking problem for him. Uh, by knowing that Bonanno was in hiding in Montreal and knowing that the commission was pissed off and looking for him, he was put in the middle of a political issue. Uh, Bonanno was really his support system on the commission, and, and Bonanno was his boss. But he also had to abide by the commission, and you cannot be loyal to both at the same time. It's either one or the other. So the commission reaches out many times to Montreal because they know he's there, and they explain to Vic Catroni that Bonanno needs to come back to New York uh, and we promise that he will not be harmed, but he has to come answer for this. Bonanno refused to budge, putting further pressure on Vic Catroni. So Catroni's the guy in the middle of all of this. Uh, the commission was getting impatient. What they end up doing is, and a lot of people may not know this, but they end up sending uh, Sam the Plumber de Cavalcante, who was the namesake and boss of the New Jersey de Cavalcante crime family, to Montreal to sit down with Joe Bonanno. They were friendly. Let's send Sam the Plumber. Hopefully he can iron this shit out. Uh, at this meeting, which was attended by Joe Bonanno and Vic Catroni, Di Cavalcante explains in no certain terms that sitting in Montreal looked bad for both Catroni and Bonanno and that the best thing was for Joe Bonanno to go back to New York and just face the commission and get it over with. He reassured, he reassured Bonanno that he would not be hurt and explained that um, that uh, sort of proof that they weren't going to hurt anybody is the fact that Joe Bonanno's son was still alive because they could have reached out and whacked his son and they didn't do it. They left it alone. He explained that the commission would have, you know, likely killed his son in retaliation for his errors, but they chose not to, which should prove to him they're not going to get violent. Uh, Bonanno, fearing that he's going to be killed, basically looks at Di Cavalcante and uh, basically tells him, go back and tell Gambino, Lucchese, and Magadino that I don't recognize anything they fucking say. I don't abide by any commission at all. Uh, nor will I ever recognize them as the governing body of anything. So in other words, he's basically telling them to go fuck themselves. 
uh, De Cavalcante exacerbated with the whole situation explains that in saying that this could create a war and it was not a very smart move. And Bonanno basically scoffed at the whole entire ID or the whole entire idea of it. And De Cavalcante stated uh, to Catroni, who was also trying to get Joe Bonanno to do the right thing, um, that you know, he looks at Catroni like, what do you want me to do? And Catroni just kind of shrugs his shoulders like, I, you know, what do you want me to do? Uh, and Bonanno just uh, refuses to do the right thing. So De Cavalcante goes back to New York and he explains Bonanno's position. So with Bonanno refusing to budge, Catroni's got a problem now. Uh, not only is the commission going to look to exert its authority uh, over people, but they're going to be pissed because he's basically slapped them in the face. And now you have Catroni who's beholden to Bonanno, not forcing the issue either. Uh, and that's not the, the, the commission is one thing, but now they got to worry about Stefano Magadino because for his part, he sees Bonanno hiding in Montreal is an affront to swing his family from New York to Montreal. Like he's basically going to pick up and move to Montreal. Uh, and he believed that Joe Bonanno was effectively done in the mafia, but would try to regain some sort of strange foothold and take all of Canada. And he was pissed. Whether or not that is a realistic viewpoint uh, or a reaction it is something else altogether uh, different. But uh, Bonanno had the option to do that. But ultimately, war would have erupted in Montreal as Magadino nor the American Mafia would tolerate Bonanno attempting to do that. So even if Bonanno had, had had this grand scheme of things that, okay, well, I'm just going to transplant everybody to Montreal, all hell would have broken loose uh, very, very quickly. Because you got to remember, Catroni is, you know, under the orders of Joe Bonanno, but he also has to abide by the commission. And I don't know if pressed very hard, Catroni, I think Catroni would have killed Joe Bonanno before he ever went against the commission. That's just kind of my two cents. Uh, uh, so some of you may ask, why didn't the American bosses just send men to Montreal to kill Bonanno? And the the realistic answer to that is they really couldn't. Uh, it would disrupt what they had going on there. It would have created friction with other families they were building relationships with. It just would have brought a lot of havoc to a place they didn't want to bring havoc and I think for American bosses, it was far better for them to sit back, force realignment within the family itself, and just let it play out. Uh, and that's where my friend Andrew was sort of asking the question today is, did they kind of shoot themselves in the foot not addressing some of this stuff? Because the after effects would go all the way through the 70s with this. Um, but you have to give the commission credit. I mean, there's a lot they could have done to Bonanno, but they never did. Uh or did they try and were just never successful in pulling it off? That's the bigger question. What's to say they didn't try? What's to say they didn't say, you know what, kill this fuck? But they just couldn't get it done. And we're never going to know. Uh, and I would tend to believe that that was probably more the case than them not doing anything, to be perfectly honest with you. But then again, Gambino dies in 76. So, so Vic Catroni has a problem. Not only will Bonanno not do the right thing, but now he's in Montreal. And because he's been loyal to Bonanno, he has to be loyal to the commission. And it's a position that Catroni cannot win. Even if he wanted to, he couldn't win. He kills Bonanno. The Bonanos come after him. He doesn't do what the commission says. The commission comes after him. But this is what happens. He gets a message from Stefano Magadino, which is going to change the game. And that message was, if you want to live... Remove yourself from Joe Bonanno, stay away from him and that relationship or else we will fucking kill you. <laughs> and basically that's Magadino trying to flex, right? Uh, even Magadino, even, even Magadino knew that Catroni was a strong guy. And if he could split Bonanno from Catroni and then add the Lupinos to that mix, then he could get what he always wanted in Canada, which was basically a monopoly. So Magadino's playing the game. He's trying to force a split. And he's not doing it really because he doesn't like Catroni. He's doing it because he wants Canada and he hates Joe Bonanno, even though they were cousins. You believe this shit? Uh, I, I, so I cannot imagine that Catroni was, was having an easy go of it. He's got the commission pissed. Now he's got Demo, uh, Magadino threatening his life. He's got Joe Bonanno sitting in Montreal creating highlights and problems with him in the press. But thankfully for Catroni, Bonanno ends up getting thrown out of Canada in the, in the summer of 1964. 
Not long after, police would pick up on wiretaps. Well, before I get to that, the, there's, uh, you know, before Bonanno gets thrown out, there are many that have speculated that Catroni said something to somebody that got Bonanno thrown out. I don't know what the validity of that is. I've never come across anything to prove that. But that's the easier situation for Catroni, right? If if he can use his his weight and his power with politicians to get Joe Bonanno the fuck out of his area, that's one less problem that he has to worry about. And that would make sense to me. Is that a rat move? No, that's a move you make to survive. <laughs> Straight up. Because Bonanno doesn't go to jail. He just gets deported. Uh, and and I that would have been the smartest thing he could have done. Let's just get this guy the fuck out of here. That will get Magadino off my back, and that'll get the commission off my back, and they can deal with Bonanno themselves. That would have been the smartest move uh, to make. But like I said, in the summer of 64, he gets thrown out. Not long after that, this is where things get interesting because police would pick up wiretaps in uh, Sam D. Cavalcante's office on December 23rd of 1964, and it is a meeting between Joe Nataro, who is a Bonanno crime family member, and uh, Sam the plumber. And Nataro is basically explaining on these wiretaps, which I have, but it's easier just to explain it verbally, uh, that the commission essentially wants Vic Catroni to know that he can do whatever he wants now without obstruction. So in other words, they're saying, Bonanno's done, do whatever the fuck you want, no problems here. Uh, so in other words, Catroni has nothing to worry about and because of an ongoing internal problem within the Bonanno crime family, i.e. there's going to be a split. Once everything gets situated, things will calm down. Uh, and what Nataro was actually referring to is Gaspar de Gregorio has split from Bonanno is taking the side of the commission. Also on that wiretap, de Cavalcante asks Nataro, who Gaspar has backing him. Nataro tells him that de Cavalcante or Nataro tells De Cavalcanti that Bonanno has 25 men with him, including five captains, and that included Vic Catroni. November 28th of 1966, Bill Bonanno, Carl Samari, Peter Magadino, Vito De Filippo, uh, Pete Nataro, and Pat De Filippo head to Montreal. That meeting was basically uh, set up to discuss the Montreal Expo of 1967. Police would intercept Bonanno's car and inside would find three loaded handguns and all would be arrested and deported out of the country for possessing illegal handguns. When news reaches Stefano Magadino that Bill Bonanno was having a meeting there with Vic Catroni, he was absolutely fucking, he goes batshit crazy. Uh, and the way that the Magadino sees this is, okay, well, Bonanno leaves and this fucker can't, he's not doing what we asked him to do. We were told him to leave Bonanno the fuck alone, stay away from the Bonanno crime family. Look at this prick. He's taking a meeting with them. <coughs> and Catroni kind of senses that Magadino might react this way if he finds out. So he sends a message to Magadino that he didn't plan the meeting nor requested it. They just fucking showed up. Magadino then demands that Catroni come to Buffalo and sit down on the matter which Catroni refuses because Catroni already knows Magadino's done this shit before. And it turns out that he would have been right because Magadino wanted basically ordered the death of Catroni for refusing to listen to him about the matter of dealing with the Bananos from here on out. So Catroni doesn't go because he's smart enough to know how Magadino is going to react. Plus it's an easy move for Magadino. I'll just kill Catroni. I'll absorb his family and I'll still get what I want. So Magadino was a treacherous fuck. Let me tell you. So Giacomo Lupino, knowing that the heat is on, is trying to avert Vic Catroni getting killed. Okay. And what he does is he goes to see Stefano Magadino. Um, he wanted there to be peace, uh, but more so he had an idea that he thought Magadino would like. He explains that his son-in-law, Paolo Violi, was working with Catroni and that if Catroni makes uh, Violi, the underboss of that crime family, then Magadino has more control over the situation. He has ultimate control over the Catroni crime family. And it basically meant that they would have a leader within the Catroni crime family who didn't like Joe Bonanno at all, and he could be a good plant for them. Their eyes, their ears, and somebody who would align with them versus Vic Catroni. So basically, it meant by proxy, they're going to control the goddamn family. And Magadino goes along with it. Says, That's a fucking fantastic idea. 
Uh, and Magadino believed that Violi would sort of be his eyes and ears within the Catroni crime family. and It would serve them down the line if and when Magadino decided to make a move against the Catronis in Montreal in general. Violi didn't eat, Violi didn't like Bonanno or Magadino for that matter, though. And a phone call intercepted in 1967. Violi is caught on a wiretap telling his brother-in-law, Jimmy Lupino, that he wished Catroni would just declare independence from New York and just establish his own crime family. Why are we listening to this fucking commission? We can do our own fucking thing. And that should sort of give you a clue on what is about to go down at some point within this crime family. So during the 1960s, the mafia had a pretty good hold over Canada and independent criminals were getting a little fed up. Many despised the mafia for taking over areas that widely were considered open territory, and nobody hated them more than a guy by the name of Richard Blass. Blass was a gangster in every sense, a bit of a fucking nutcase. He hated the mafia, and more so, he hated Italians. <laughs> uh, Blass, whose childhood was earmarked by repeated violence galore, I uh, would go on to become a hitman for the West End gang, which is which was established in the 1950s, made up mainly of Irish Canadian gangsters in Montreal. Whereas the mafia was more of a global traditional entity, the West End was more of a neighborhood group that expanded and just grew, homegrown. Uh, Blash just didn't like the grease balls whatsoever, as he notoriously would scream when he would see any Italian. So it wouldn't take long for Blast to just get fed up with the Italians, and he literally goes to war with the Catronis. Blast felt like the Catronis were unrelenting in their ways and were overexpanding into areas that didn't belong to them, and he decides, fuck them. I'm going to do what I got to do. And the first thing he does was he threatens a guy by the name of Joe DiMaolo and his brother Vincenzo, who were made guys within the Catronis. Blast essentially basically walked up to them and threatened to kill them right to their fucking faces. Uh, and it wasn't just an idle threat. This is not a guy who's going to say it and not do it. On May 7th, 1968, Frank Catroni, who at that time was the day-to-day -day sort of overseer of the Catroni crime family, is literally walking out of his house flanked by two bodyguards. The second his bodyguards step outside the front door, uh, shots rang out. Blast and his partner, Robert Allard, opened up fire. They didn't fuck around. Just start hammering them bullets. As Blast and Allard opened fire somehow uh, by some stroke of luck Catroni managed to duck and go the other direction and his two bodies were killed his two bodyguards were killed on the fucking spot a few days later two of Blass's men were coming out of a store these men were Gilles Bienvenu and Albert Quiment they are both whacked by men, uh, by two men in ski masks excuse me they were whacked immediately by two men in ski masks uh, and were dead on the spot later that day uh, Blass henchman gets whacked. Uh, Roger Larue. Blass was irate, as was the Catroni crime family. Blass then takes it to a whole nother fucking level <laughs> and begins killing Italians. Not even related to the Catroni crime. Catroni crime family. He just starts killing Italian people. He doesn't give a fuck. He hates them. May twenty seventh, Joe Caliza gets shot five times in the fucking head. Wasn't an organized crime gay guy. Wasn't related to the Catronis. He was just an Italian that walked through the wrong section of the fucking neighborhood. Blass just hated Italians that much and was not opposed to killing civilians whatsoever. Weeks later, Blass kills Francesco Grotto. Grotto actually was a known loan shark and was shot several times. August 24th of 68, Blass was drinking in a bar. The front door opens, two men enter with guns. Shots ring out, and Blast gets hit several times but manages to survive. Two weeks later, the Catronis tracked Blast to a motel by the name of Lee Manor de Pleasance in a suburb of Montreal. While Blast was sleeping, <laughs> he was awoken with smoke and fire. Three people died in the building fire, but somehow yet Blast survives. They just set the whole goddamn motel on fire. <laughs> what damn minute. Oh, God. Uh, October of 1968, Blass is in a garage with a counterpart by the name of Claude Menard, who was a business partner when the two get ambushed. <laughs> I know this is horrible to laugh at this, but Blass gets shot in the back of the fucking head. So he gets shot from behind. It goes in the back of his head, out the fucking front, and he's still alive and talking. <laughs> He reminds me of John VZ gets shot in the back of the head and is still talking. Um, both survive and blast, but blast recognized the shooter as Joe DiMaolo. 
that actually essentially ended the war between the two. Uh, but Blass was a fucking maniac. Uh, in January of 1969, him and his crew attempt to rob a bank and they fail epically. During the attempted robbery, as Blass is walking out the front door, a cop walks up and uh, Blass doesn't even hesitate, just blows his head off just because he was a cop. He would be arrested and sentenced to four consecutive life terms for that. However, <laughs> in October of that year, Blast pulls a magic trick and he ends up escaping uh, prison while being transported from one prison to the other. A week later, he's rearrested after somebody rats him out. In 1974, Blast has someone smuggling a handgun into jail and Blast uses it for his escape again by getting a guard at gunpoint and then he begins to let people out of their cells and then leads them to the armory where everybody loads up on weapons. Blass escapes while Blass is out. He's still furious that two of his former friends dimed him out over the attempted bank robbery. <laughs> what he's about to do is just the nuttiest shit on October 30th of 1974. He tracks his former friends, Raymond Lauren and Roger Levesque to the bar. He knew these guys ratted him out, got him indicted for the bank robbery, and he hasn't forgotten it. Blast walks in and kills them both on the spot. Just walks in the front door, bang, bang, and that's it. Real, this is where it gets crazy. Realizing that there's like 11 other people sitting in this bar, he does something that's absolutely fucking insane. He walks out after killing these two pricks in front of 13 people. Somehow he memorizes all of their faces, and he waits for three months, and then he returns to that same exact bar with a guy by the name of Fernand uh, Baudet. <laughs> As they walk in, they see 13 people. They locked the door, and they lined up everybody against the wall and blew everybody's fucking head off. Ten men and three women all got killed just for witnessing a crime that he committed three months prior. That murder led to one of the largest manhunts in Canadian history. Eventually, the police track Blass, and Blass hold up, hold up in a building. Eventually, the cops have enough, and they enough of the bullshit. They kick down the doors and go in. And Blass isn't about to take it sitting down. He starts opening fire, and he's shot twenty-seven times before he falls down and dies. <laughs> Oh, these people are fucking crazy. And you guys can go on further to read about Blass. I mean, he's just an interesting character. So while, so while the Blass issue was ongoing, more wiretaps picked up some unsettling information within the Catroni crime family. Violi, who is considered to be Catroni's right-hand man, is talking to Giacomo Lupino, his father-in-law. On that call, Violi is trashing Vic Catroni, claiming he's a soft leader, he's a weak leader for being at the beck and call of the commission and the Bonanno crime family. And he boasts that if he had the chance to tell Bill Bonanno what he thought of him, he fucking would. He'd slap him across the face. And he explains verbatim, I would, I would tell Bill what a dishonest guy he is. I would show up and tell him just what the fuck I think of him. I would have told him, I'm not with you. I'm not with your family. I'm on my own. I'm by myself. I don't want to have anything to do with anyone because you're all a bunch of thieving bastards. Violi, who is yet to be named underboss in any fashion or form, is displaying a lack of respect for Catroni and the mafia hierarchy. It's Violi having ambition. It's Violi printing like a peacock. And it's laying out that the future of the family is his, not anyone else. And this is setting the stage for some problems. Not only is Violi widely expecting to be named underboss under Frank Catroni, but he's also widely expecting to shove not just Frank, but Vic the fuck out of his way. As the 1960s are coming to a close, a lot of things are about to change for the Catroni crime family. Not only is Vic going to name Violi the official underboss, but some political issues are going to arise with a slew of problems. If Catroni had been successful up to this point and avoided a lot of the mess that Joe Bonanno created, 
he is about to have a problem within his own crime family because Violi is about to begin to ruffle feathers and about to create a massive instability within the family that had been sort of the staple for years. There was never instability. Everything was perfect, but now it's about to be sort of turned upside down on its hinges. Not only will the Catronis have an issue with nonstop wiretaps, but also a huge issue politically with the FLQ and the Catronis will try their best to sway politicians over a casino legislation act. And Catroni will be outed as the boss of the mafia in headlines. And Vic Catroni will make a huge error in removing his brother as the de facto street boss, naming Violi the acting boss. And Frank Catroni will just become a lowly captain within the crime family, which is about to result in the form of war. So next week when we come back, it's going to be the conclusion of the Catronis. And we're going to see how this all unfolds. And I, you know, I hate to laugh, but I'm still cracking up about this guy blast. What a fucking nut. <laughs> oh, 13 of them saw me. Huh? Well, they're all going to die. <laughs> just, I laugh at just the sheer fucking nuttiness of these people. So I hope you're learning something from the Catroni crime family because it's a history lesson that we've seen repeated in the Gambinos, the Genovese's, the Lucchese's, and the Columbo's. We've seen this uh, just repeated. And every mob family we've ever talked about, history keeps repeating itself. And that's why I always say on these shows, if you do not learn from it, you are bound to repeat it with the same fucking results. And that's just the way it is. All right, so we'll be back next week with an all-new show. Uh, I hope you guys are learning something about the Catronis. If you find this interesting, do me a favor. Reach out to me at mobtalkradioshow at gmail.com and let me know if you're enjoying the Catronis. I haven't heard anybody talk about the Canada, the Canadian crime families like we are. And if they have, I sure as fuck haven't seen it. But I hope you're learning something.